Sleep divorce is where you will sleep either in separate locations or at least in separate beds. Mm -hmm. The diluted version of the sleep divorce rather than sleeping in separate rooms and separate beds is called the Scandinavian method, which you think is sounds so much more salacious than it actually is, which is essentially you've just got two separate beds that you put side by side and that's the diet version of a sleep divorce. But I do think that sleep divorce idea is important because it is a taboo and it also can markedly improve things for people. So when we've looked at survey data, both in the US and also in the UK with the National the, the Sleep Council there, what you find is that about one out of every four couples who are surveyed will tell you that they have had a sleep divorce, that they will sleep in separate beds. And we think that that may be in part an underestimate because of the stigma associated with it. And if you survey people anonymously, you get to a number of almost one out of every three people will admit to waking up at least in different locations. And there is pretty good evidence from the science as to why that number may make sense. You know, why 25% of all couples suggest that. When we study couples who are sleeping together, objectively on almost every measure that we can quantify about sleep, sleep is worse when you're sleeping as a couple relative to when you're sleeping separately. The twist in the tail there, though, is that when you ask people about the satisfaction of sleep, there is definitely some group of individuals that say, look, I feel more satisfied with my sleep when I'm sleeping with my partner than when I'm sleeping separately, despite the fact that objectively their sleep is worse. So I'm not suggesting it's a a one size fits all. But I think the taboo comes from the idea that, well, if you're not sleeping together, then you're not sleeping together. And the exact That's British opposite. for having intercourse. So I mean. <laughs> thank <laughs> you very much. Yeah. Can we just get over this. It's my desperately unfortunate Hugh Grant genes that has me sort of trying to navigate around the topic rather than just like saying it straight. So thank you, Tim. Yes. If you're not sleeping together, then you're not having sex. You're not having intercourse. Yes. But the oh come on, Matthew. Hold it together. But it turns out that. The opposite is true, that when you get a couple who are sleeping well, their sex life actually improves. And it's probably for three reasons that we've uncovered. The first is hormones. The second is sensitivity. And the third is libido. And I'll try to park my Hugh Grant and get right into it. In terms of the hormones... <laughs> Take off the gloves, Matt. Yeah, Take yeah, off I the know. gloves. Come on, it's time. <laughs> I'm wondering what you what you mean by saying take off the glove in terms yeah. of this conversation, but <laughs> let me just skip it. You see, you opened the door, Tim, and I walked right oh, through. Here we go. Or put on the gloves, if you prefer. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think probably best, <laughs> but we know each other quite well now, so maybe. Anyway, in terms of the hormones, firstly, we know that testosterone, gosh, it takes a pretty sharp nosedive in males and in females when you're not sleeping well. Mm -hmm. males who, if we put them on a diet of maybe four or five hours of sleep, they drop their levels of testosterone somewhere by about 10 years of aging. So a lack of sleep will age a man by a decade in terms of virility. It's also true of estrogen in women. And so when those two sex hormones are not in play, you get a reduction in the quality of the sex life. The second component, and this is data that we've only really got in females, less so in males, but the, the sensitivity of female genitalia increases when sleep is in high volume versus when people are not getting sufficient sleep. And we think that's due to the estrogen, that when estrogen is in normative amounts because you're sleeping well, there is greater vaginal lubrication, which therefore leads to greater sensitivity and greater pleasure by way of sex. And then the final aspect is libido. We've also found that when a woman obtains an extra one hour of sleep, there is a 14% increase in her desirability to be intimate to have sex with her partner. And I find that interesting because if you put it in context, the FDA approved drugs for increased libido in, in women, things like, I think it's called Vilesi is one of them I know, that will increase libido in women by about 24%. 
But here is the simple addition of one hour of extra sleep. You can get more than 50% of that benefit drug-free. Question for you, Matt. How are these drug companies measuring increases in libido? Is it a self-reported one to 10 scale or something like that, which can be very fungible? (laughs) (laughs) It's self-reported. So many of those scales are subject. You know, it's very much like pain that it's when it comes to libido, it's somewhat difficult to quantify. And of course, it's not just about innate biological libido. The conditions have to be right. You have to have the relationship with your partner, which actually also reminds me, by the way, when couples are not sleeping well, and this was a study from UC Berkeley, not from my lab, but what they found is that they have more fights. They don't resolve conflict nearly as well between them when they're having a fight. And the reason is because you lose empathy. When you're not sleeping well, your ability to empathize with other individuals, and we now have demonstrated why in terms of the brain networks, you decrease that capacity for understanding the other. And no wonder you're fighting and you're fighting in a pretty poor way. So what's the playbook? What's the best practices? Good question. I think I'm not suggesting that a sleep divorce is for everyone by any means whatsoever. There are some people for whom they adore sleeping with their partner for lots of reasons, safety, security, intimacy. But I think if you are interested in it, take a graded approach. And I would suggest firstly, just having an open, gentle conversation and don't be defensive about it. The second is don't suggest that it's permanent. Offer the idea that, look, could we do this? You know, darling, could we do this for the next week or the next two weeks? And I'm not suggesting it's forever. Let's just see. And let's just try it on for size. Then I think what people misunderstand about sleeping together in the same bed is what they miss. They don't really miss the majority of time because for the majority of time you're asleep and you're non-conscious. What you really miss are the bookends of sleep. That sort of getting into bed, having a cuddle, saying a good night, and in the morning waking up and doing the same thing. So if you have a sleep divorce, what you can also do is build that in. So, you know, whoever goes to bed first, the other person comes in, you have your time, you you sort of cuddle, do whatever you need to do, and then you leave, and then you repeat the same process in the morning. You don't have to do that every day, of course, it's not going to be practical. But in that way, you sort of get the benefits of sleeping together whilst still having a sleep divorce, if that makes some sense. So I would just say, you know, be, be honest with yourself. I feel like sleep divorce needs a rebrand, maybe furniture polyamory, since you'd be on separate <laughs> pieces of furniture. <laughs> Sounds really sort of risque, taboo, kind of sexy. I am <laughs> so stealing that because yeah, when you bring that up, you know, at a dinner conversation and you finally admit it to your friends, they all think, oh no, they're on the rocks, you know, but yeah, yeah. furniture <laughs> polyamory all sorts of, you know, swings from the ceiling and... Oh, it sounds very exciting. Very exciting. Yeah, candle wax <laughs> on the nipples. Let's go. They're killing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. 